Oh, Kevin, you've done it again. On the surface, this should be an excellent film based on the concept. The Ant-Man family gets trapped in the quantum realm, having to fight to get back home, but getting intercepted by Kang the Conqueror along the way. Seems interesting, right? Unfortunately, the MCU can't help itself, and insists on being as dumb as possible. Scott Lang is living large after Endgame, just enjoying life, writing books, and going on dates with his... wife? They got married, right? <laughs> They have not found. In any case, there's trouble in paradise because his daughter Cassie is now a peaceful protester who jumps in and out of jail for duking it out with cops. In her most recent encounter, she was apparently trying to save a homeless camp from getting cleared out by the police. She complains that it's too expensive to get housing and about how people can't afford rent anymore. But in just the last scene, they blanket Hope Van Dyne with numerous praises, including making affordable housing for everyone. So a lovely example of having your Baskin Robbins cake and eating it too right out the gate. Scott, Lang, and Hope don't discipline their daughter in any way of course. When Scott tries to, the other two get all uppity about telling her what to do, as if that's the problem. And of course, he backs down and goes all like, Oh, you can do what you want, I'm just giving suggestions. No, dummy, you're the dad. You should absolutely tell your idiot child what to do, because she's an idiot and a jailhopper. Not only that, but she reveals that she's been stealing and using Ant-Man technology to conduct her antics, even somehow managing to make her own super suit without Scott finding out. She talks all kinds of crap and disrespects him to his face, and he just resorts to telling jokes to deflect the conversation. There's also an odd reoccurring issue within these films, because Scott Lang is presented as this ex-con who's had a hard life and is just trying to make things good for his daughter, so she doesn't have to go through it too. But he's also played by Paul Rudd, so his character isn't exactly an easy sell. This irritating, bass awkward dynamic continues during a family dinner, as Scott Lang learns of his daughter's numerous crimes that he was somehow completely unaware of. Scott tries to warn her not to have the same life that he did, but everyone else at the table takes Cassie's side, because at least she's doing something unlike you. And they give Ant-Man crap, because even even though he helped save the universe, he hasn't done much for them lately. What arrogant stupidity. Imagine going up to a World War II veteran and being like, um, I don't see you fighting in Korea. Some hero you are, you lazy bastard. No, that's not how that works. Scott Lang deserves to spend the rest of his life happy and retired for all the work that he's done. And everyone else here is a twat for trying to disturb that. Especially the daughter who virtue signals for the homeless while sleeping in a mansion and getting bailed out by her rich family. Whoa, I think I just figured something out, Beavis. <laughs> what? <laughs> this sucks. By the way, the pimps could easily create a tiny housing market that could shelter thousands while taking up virtually no space at all, so this should be a non-issue anyway. But we need problems so we can grandstand and virtue signal. We never actually see these problems or the people being affected, mind you. You're just supposed to get mad at Ant-Man because he doesn't care. The humor is also the same old garbage that they usually pump out. Here's an example. Hey, what are you guys up to? Science with ants. Ant science. <laughs> So yeah, nothing new here. But the dialogue leads us to reveal that Cassie has built a quantum telescope that will allow her to map the quantum realm. Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Being a genius in the MCU means literally nothing anymore. This random daughter of a convict who was parentless for five years can just cook this thing up in her spare time. Okay, whatever. Just don't ask me to care about your story any more than the writers do. The reveal of this invention enrages Janet Van Dyne, because now her entire character is just, I hate the quantum realm. Don't mess with the quantum realm even though she seemed pretty okay with it before. But I guess we're just going to ignore that. She seems understandably pissed, especially because it was made behind her back. But Hope retorts by saying, We tried to ask you about the quantum realm, but you just never wanted to talk about it. Okay, so there's a clear difference between, Hey Grandpa, I'd like to hear about the war, and, Hey Grandpa, I've been spying on the Japanese, just in case, you know. The latter is far more alarming than the former, for an obvious litany of reasons. And of course, disaster strikes right at that moment because the quantum telescope goes haywire and sucks up everything in the room, including the entire family. And thus, Quantumania runs wild, brother. The family gets separated into two groups, Scott and Cassie in one, Hope, Janet, and Hank Pym in the other. I'll be nice for a moment and give credit to the VFX artists who know out slaved over this film. While under Kevin's unreasonable working conditions, the film has a colorful, eye-catching art style with plenty of fun creatures and characters to look at. There are a handful of ugly and sloppy scenes, but that's to be expected nowadays. Regardless, the effects turned out surprisingly well considering the astronomical workload a super effect-heavy film like this would require. But that does bring me to another odd topic about this film, in that yes, there are other characters, other societies, and even other humans that already live here. Unlike the wild hellscape this place was presented as in films prior, the quantum realm is basically just another planet now. If you weren't paying attention, you could easily confuse this movie for one of the Guardians of the Galaxy films. And yeah, 
there are just other normal looking humans who were just born here and that's all there is to it. When they first land in the realm, a spark of fun is initially ignited, as it would be exciting to see how these two different groups try to survive in this dangerous world, meet up, and get home. The Wasp having her very experienced mother to rely on, plus Hank, and Cassie relying on her father, who only has a relatively basic understanding of this place, with both groups having very different skills and abilities. And unfortunately, this concept does not last long at all, as both groups immediately find other civilized societies, and the survival element just vanishes in favor of weird people talking for two hours. Scott and Cassie encounter an off-the-radar group of rebels. Cassie knows nothing about them, what they fight for, or who they fight against, but she hears the phrase freedom fighters, and she's immediately like, sign me up, I'll happily die for your cause. And dad, you're a piece of shit if you don't sign up too. And of course, the leader of this group is one of the most basic examples of the strong independent woman archetype you'll ever see. Meanwhile, Janet leads her group to Bill Murray, no, really, and reveals that she's basically just been sleeping with him for the last 30 years, while we all thought she was fighting for her life that whole time. She even makes this weird horny face whenever she looks at him, and Hank's just like, yeah, that's fine. I slept around with other women while you were gone too. Don't you just love this wholesome family? By the way, throughout this entire movie, Janet's dialogue is incredibly obnoxious. She could be very helpful by explaining to her family what the dangers are and how they will survive, but she simply chooses not to because there is no time or a handful of other bullshit excuses. The only reason she does this is because the writers don't want to reveal any surprises to the audience before they are ready to present them in a cinematic way. A talented writer could make Janet talk like a reasonable person while still leaving some surprises, but no one with such talent or skill was brought onto this project. Throughout the entire first half of the film, there are also buckets of references to Kang that are obviously about Kang, but everyone awkwardly talks around saying the name Kang because it's meant to be some big reveal or something stupid like that. You. Writers in the Dum Dum Corner. Listen up. You can have people talk normal and refer to your villain by name whenever it's relevant, while still hyping up danger and mystery for your villain before he appears on screen. There's something down there. It's gone. He's been following us for three days. Bill Murray betrays Janet and attempts to capture her group on behalf of Kang, but they escape in a ship, and flying the ship is mostly what Hank Pym will do for the remainder of the film, along with standing in the background and being forgotten. While that's happening, the Freedom Fighters get discovered by Kang's forces and a battle begins. Cassie reveals that she brought her super suit with her, and to show that she's inexperienced at fighting, they have her wobble around a bit, but then Scott gives her a comedically useless tip, and after that she fights with relatively no issues whatsoever. Jump tap, right? One move, jump tap. I know how to do it, Dad. Scott needed extensive training in order to use his suit, but whatever. Fans have been criticizing sequels that do this for decades now, and Hollywood has yet to budge. So here we are again. Eventually, they, along with the Freedom Fighters, get defeated and captured by none other than MODOK, the mechanized organism designed only for killing. Even the mind of a so-called immortal is no match for MODOK. And this is probably one of the worst villain adaptations to date, and that is saying a lot because the MCU has fumbled its villains since day one. In the comics, MODOK is basically a biological supercomputer, hence his big brain. As a result, his personality is very logic-oriented and stale, with his main priority in life being killing, as his name would suggest. They say as much in the film, but they show the exact opposite. He isn't a machine at all. He's Dennis, aka Yellowjacket. Yep, you heard that right. The most boring, irrelevant villain is back in an even worse form. Wait, his name's Darren. I thought it was Dennis. That's an actual mistake I made. That wasn't a joke. Oh boy. They show a million flashbacks when he's introduced as well, because they know that nobody's gonna remember this guy. Apparently after the first film, he just got a big head. Then Kang came along and put him in a giant floating wheelchair, then just arbitrarily called him Modok. Despite the fact that he doesn't live up to that name in any way whatsoever, he does pretty much everything but kill in this movie. Modok is also traditionally a major Avengers level threat, but here he's just a lackey that everybody laughs at. That's not Modok. They also repeat the same predictable joke several times over, where a character will meet Modok and they'll go, Darren, no, what the hell happened? And man, he looks so fucking stupid. He looks worse than She Hulk. He looks worse than any character ever filmed. Modok already has a ridiculous design that Warren's being made fun of, but this goes way too far to the point of being pitiful. It's desperate. It screams, You like funny, right? Look at him, he's funny. Watch the funny man say funny things. You like this, right? It's exhausting. The MCU higher ups just can't help but make everything stupid again and again. Why can't we just have good movies anymore without all this stupid crap getting in the way? Why can't you just adapt characters as they are instead of? 
of turning everything stupid. You people need help. You are addicted to being stupid, and it shows all over your work. Go to rehab and replace yourselves with people who know how to not be idiots. <clears throat> anyway, Janet finally decides to speak up and reveals that she met Kang in the quantum realm, and they try to escape together until she discovered that he's a multiverse conquering madman. So she destroyed the MacGuffin that would have allowed them to escape. By the way, when she's with Kang, they seem to have a little too much chemistry together. I guess it makes sense why she never wanted to speak about her time in the quantum realm now, because she just spent the whole time shagging it up with anything that had skin. We later see Scott and Cassie imprisoned as they come face to face with Kang himself. Jonathan Majors as Kang is... fine, but he leaves a lot to be desired. He looks the part, but anytime he speaks, he sounds unconvincing, like he's playing a part instead of being the part. He's not very imposing either. He's often overly emotional and soft, not really having the presence required of a multiversal conqueror. His costume is good at least, which is high praise, because those things are very rare to come by in these movies. The Wasp also has a fine costume, though Ant-Man and Cassie look a little too generic and samey. They also still do those crappy CGI costume swaps from Endgame that have never looked good, and everyone loves to wear their helmets as little as possible, to the point where you can't even really tell what Cassie's looks like. Kang states that he wants to recruit Scott to help him retrieve a MacGuffin so he can escape the quantum realm. Scott initially refuses, but Kang threatens to kill Cassie so he gives in. He wants Scott specifically due to his background as a thief. So naturally, his thieving skills will never come into play when the time comes. Instead, they do a bit from a Rick and Morty episode until Wasp appears, and she and Scott retrieve the MacGuffin together. The two groups then finally converge and join forces, but Kang steps in to be evil. He takes the MacGuffin and leaves with Janet and Cassie. He and Janet talk about a bunch of multiversal gobbledygook. Cassie escapes, then we rejoin Ant-Man and Wasp, as Hank Pym joins them while accompanied by a bunch of ants. They also got sucked down here from Hank's lab, and apparently they've become a sentient, socialist society during their time here. Not kidding. This develops development is presented to be funny, but come on Hollywood, you don't have to be coy, we know you're really into that stuff. Cassie frees strong woman from her cell and validates how cool she is. Then she makes a generic speech to the quantum people that will lead them to reenact the ending of Rise of Skywalker. She then battles MODOK and effortlessly beats the hell out of him. Then after, she literally tells him to not be a dick and that inspires him to change teams. It's cringy and sad watching them try so hard to make this MODOK thing funny, but it is just so lame. Ant-Man arrives at the size of Godzilla in order to confront Kang. In the comics, Going big left a massive physical toll on Hank, so brutal to the point where he considered retiring. But I guess that's just not a thing here, which makes you wonder why Scott doesn't just go this big in every fight. He could have prevented a lot of earlier problems by doing that. In any case, he shows up and gets wrecked until the Freedom Fighters jump in to help. Wasp is also there, being forgettable as ever. Plenty of her fight scenes involve her just standing in place with her arm raised and wriggling her body while CGI bullets plop out. Then the good guys do a bunch of good stuff and start winning. Then Kang appears and does MODOK's job for him. Wasp, Batman, and Cassie have a mild the interesting but very short fight with Kang. Then, when all seems hopeless, the socialist ants appear to save everybody. Why weren't they there from the start? Because cinematics. Kang hides himself in a bubble, but then Modok appears. He proudly proclaims his name is Darren and Kamikaze's Kang, killing himself in the process. Then he makes some of the most unfunny, cringy jokes as his final words. And goodbye Modok, what a pathetic, horrible waste of potential you turned out to be. Then Ant-Man and friends make a portal home with the MacGuffin. They fight Kang a bit more, he gets flumped away, then it ends. During the fight, there's an odd moment where the portal gets destroyed, and it seems like Ant-Man and Wasp will be left behind, but then Cassie just immediately reopens it, so it's fine. The post credit scene shows more nonsensical Kang multiverse sludge, and that's it. This film is pretty inconsequential overall, leaving no real impact except for the characters it ruined. Every other character is just as irrelevant and forgettable as they were at the start, only now they're all sympathetic to Antifa and the socialist movement. It's at least nice to see Ant-Man have a more important role than he did in the last film, but Wasp was so unimportant that it feels like the writers actually forgot about her at times, and I'm sure you will too by the time you leave the theater. Who am I kidding? You're not gonna go see this.